There's no doubt that identity is complicated. What other people see may or may not accurately reflect how a person identifies. Filmmaker Danielle Ayao explores such complexity in her short doc titled, But You're Not Black. It's part of this year's Caribbean Tales Film Festival, and Danielle Ayao joins us now from Toronto for more. Hi, Danielle. Hi, thanks for having me. Congratulations on your short making the film festival. We actually have a, a clip of it to show to everyone before we start our conversation. Sheldon, please roll. When I was a kid, I didn't think about what I looked like. When I tell people that I'm Chinese Trinidadian, I get the response, you don't look mixed at all. They need to reconcile how I look with where I'm from. You know, they look in the mirror and they see something and what's looking back at them is the same way that they get treated, the names that they get called, the way that they're identified by their people. And then there's other people that look in the mirror and it's not that simple. No, you're not black. You are Trinidadian. Danielle, why did you want to make this film? I'll be truthfully honest with you. Um, I guess when I was starting to discover that I wasn't quite what people thought I was, I it almost started off like a bit of a joke. Like, I wanted to create this documentary, so if anybody has any questions about my, my ancestry, I could just point them to this documentary because I guess I was so... I was so tired of having the same conversation over and over with people. And then as I grew older, I I just had this sudden urge that I'm like, I need to make this this documentary. I need to have this discussion with people. I need to find my community. So that's how it all began. So what did you hear? Um, because first of all, what is your background? So I am Chinese Trinidadian. So my ancestors are based in China, but my parents, both my parents, are born and raised in Trinidad, and my grandparents moved over to Trinidad when they were, when they were children. So they were pretty much raised in Trinidad as well. So when you would say that you were of Trini descent, you heard what? Oh, I heard, but you're not black, which is the title. I heard, um, but where are you really from? You know, they didn't quite believe me. They, they often asked if I was mixed, and if I was mixed, uh, which parent was black? Mm. Or they just flat out told me, you don't look mixed at all. You look very fair. Mm. Uh, so I heard a lot of that growing up. I get that same question because I'm African, and people are like, you're not African, and people tell me <laughs> where I'm from. Um, for you, you could just identify as Chinese, why is it important for you to identify as Chinese Trinidad Trinidadian? I guess I was I was instilled by my grandparents and my parents this this strong sense of pride in Trinidad because my grandparents when they came over and they were very young, they knew that they were coming over and they weren't going back to China. That this is their home and this is what they were gonna build and they were gonna build a business and a family here. So I I guess I have that sense of pride of what they did there and my parents growing up there and they all they have these fun stories and I grew up in what I believe would be a very Caribbean household. How big is the Chinese population in Trinidad? One to two percent. One to two percent. We're very small. We're very small. Um, in, in Trinidad, does the Chinese community feel othered? They do. Yes, yes and no. I, I've definitely heard stories of, uh, of cases of bullying and racism, but they do belong to the community and they do contribute to the community and, and obviously they do have friends, they're not segregated. Um, it, it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag, yeah. It sounds kind of painful to talk about this, is it? A little bit. Yeah. With all sensitive topics like this, and it's a very personal story, I, I don't, before this, I didn't widely share how I felt. Um, but Why? Because it is so sensitive, and it has to do a little bit with race, and it has to do a little bit with culture. 
But after making this film, I found more people coming out of the woodwork and telling me, you know what, I totally feel like that. You know, I'm Chinese, but from India, and I feel like that, or I'm East Indian, and I'm from Trinidad, and I kind of feel like this. So I think there's a large population of people who feel like parts of themselves are either ignored or overlooked because of their skin color. Mm. Well, we've been hearing a lot lately about privilege and um, about what that means. Do you think that maybe privilege plays a role in how you've been received in the sense that uh, being a Chinese Trinidadian also means that you have access to spaces that other Trinidadians wouldn't have because they're black? Yes. I definitely acknowledge that I have privileges that that other black Trinidadians do not have, which I think is extremely unfair and not right. I'll tell you a very quick story. Mm -hmm. um, when I go to Trinidad and when I come back from Trinidad, with customs, they don't really bat an eye with me. A lot of, I noticed a lot of Trinidadians and Jamaicans, for example, coming back, they'll be pulled into secondary. Their stuff will be searched. They assume that they're bringing back, you know, food items that may not be allowed back, for example. But with me, they don't bat an eye. They're like, oh, she was probably a tourist. She was on vacation in Trinidad. So, you know, she's not smuggling back, you know, tons and tons of packets of like, Polori mix mm. or anything in her suitcase. She's not bringing back tons of food items, which is not necessarily true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have, I've had that experience too because uh, you're treated, even in Uganda, I'm treated better because I have lighter skin um, and I'm treated better than other uh, people in Uganda who live there um, because they have darker skin. How do you reconcile that? Um, I'm not sure of my answer just yet. Yeah. I, I try to be the best ally I can to, to the black population in Trinidad and the black population globally and in Canada. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure what, what the best way is yet. When did you first start to feel like you weren't Trinidadian? Other people were treating you like you weren't Trinidadian. Well, I grew up in Scarborough, which has a very large Chinese Caribbean population. So chances are when you told people that, they knew somebody else who was Chinese Caribbean. So that wasn't so much of a big deal there. And then when I moved out of Scarborough, the university, that's when I really noticed it because I wasn't, I think I was one out of three Asians in the, my entire program. It wasn't a very diverse program. And so my color became way more of a conversation piece. It was like stamped over my forehead. And that's when I started to get a lot of these responses, but you're not black, where are you really from? And that's when I was like, okay, is there something wrong with me? Is there something that I don't see or that I don't know about myself? Well, you visited Trinidad for Independence Day. What was that experience like? I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I. I was there with my family and I could feel the sense of pride that people had for their country and their independence. And it was, it was beautiful. I didn't feel out of place. Nobody was looking at me. It was, it was great. It was really wonderful. Uh, in the documentary, you interview um, a Chinese Trinidadian woman named Patricia. She told you, you're holding on to an idea that doesn't exist. What does she mean? There is a notion, there is a notion that unless you are born in the country, you are not that country. So if I wasn't born in, Trinid in Trinidad, then I'm not really Trinidadian, um, which a lot of people experience with various different cultures when they go back home and they feel like they're involved and they feel like they're part of this culture but really they're holding on to this kind of beautiful ideal of their parents growing up there. And, but really they have a weird kind of Canadianized version of their culture. Well, how did you take her, um, her response? It made me think, mm. it definitely made me think about what I thought about my culture, um, how much I know 
about my actual culture and about my country. Um, but you know what? I respect, I respect everybody's posi- everybody's position. It mm-hmm. differs, and I and I totally get that. Hence why I made this movie because I I recognize that there's just so many ways to approach cultural identity, and there's no there's no definitive answer. You also interviewed a Caribbean studies professor at Ryerson University, um, and you spoke about a feeling called cultural dissonance. What is that? Mm-hmm. So you look in the mirror and you see one thing. I see my parents, I see my grandparents, I see my heritage, I see, you know, the fact that I play Carabana every year and things like that. And then everybody on the outside is telling me, you're Chinese, but you're just Chinese. Where are you really from? Um, You know, what Chinese food do you like? Have you ever been back to China? And they're telling you something that doesn't match how you're feeling inside. Mm-hmm. So that's cultural dissonance. How common is that feeling amongst other people of Chinese Caribbean descent? Very common. Mm-hmm. Very common, specifically um, specifically in Canada and the United States. I, I don't necessarily hear that, or I didn't hear that, when I was in Trinidad to the people that I spoke to in Trinidad, but the people in Canada, you definitely get that, that sense. I'm surprised to hear that because you grew up in Scarborough. I live in Scarborough right now, but we have this idea in Canada that we can celebrate uh, different cultures. You can be from different people or from cultures you might not identify them from being. And so it surprises me to hear that in Canada, there is that feeling of not belonging to the culture that you identify with. Even though we are multicultural, I still think, you know, a lot of us, we attach ourselves to the assumptions of, you know, how the person looks and we derive what country they're from, how they, based on how they look. So we still hold on to that, that assumption. Having completed the doc now and uh, spoken to different people who are experiencing the same things, how do you feel about your Trini identity now? You will have to watch the movie <laughs> to find out. To find out how I feel about myself. <laughs> but do you, how do you, how do you think we can move beyond uh, what people look like when we try to put people in these boxes? How do you think we can move beyond that in society? I think keeping an open mind definitely keeping an open mind that when you do ask somebody and they tell you something, uh, you don't go on to the offensive and then start interrogating them about how it's even possible. It's, it's trying to kind of fit people into the mold as opposed to accepting what their mold is. How can people watch this documentary? It is premiering in Toronto on September 25th, digitally, Mm -hmm. on September 25th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It is live and there will be a QA. and a And then if you are in Trinidad, it actually premieres a couple days before that on the 15th in Trinidad. How are you feeling about people watching this film? Oh, nervous. Why? I think that's that's with anything that, that you create. You put it out into the world and... You know, you can't control what people think and everybody's going to have a different opinion, which is totally fine. And I welcome that. So it, it's it's nerve wracking. It's so scary. But a lot of my relatives haven't even seen this. It's important to just speak your truth, though, right? Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But I hope people will watch the film and there's no definitive conclusion. I hope it's just thought provoking and they start asking questions. I mean, it's been a weird time for everybody the past six months, uh, pivoting during a global pandemic. What does it mean to you as an artist, as a documentary filmmaker, to have your work still be able to reach an audience during this uncertain time? I think it proves that, that art is always going to be important. It's important to communities. It's important to have our voices heard and that we have the means to do it. 
even though we can't be with each other in person, there's always going to be ways that we can connect with people. Danielle, thank you so much. Congratulations and good luck with the screening. We appreciate your thank time. You. Thank you. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.